what is colorectal cancer? How common is colorectal cancer? And what are the trends? Who is at risk and what are the risk factors? And what is the adenoma carcinoma sequence? We're gonna go through all of this today in part one of a deep dive into colorectal cancer at Citizen Surgeon. Let's go. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon, and we got a whole new look. I'm trying something a little bit different, a little different setup, and today we're going to take a deep dive into colorectal cancer. Now, colorectal cancer is a huge topic, and so we can't cover it all in just one or even two episodes. So we're going to get into several episodes, and this first one is to talk about what it is, how common it is, what are the trends, and get into risk factors, even those familial cases of colon cancer and how important they are. So first, what is it? Well, colorectal cancer, this is a cancer of either the colon or the rectum. And we separate those two out because the treatment for colon cancer is different than the treatment for rectal cancer. And when we get into the treatment videos, we're going to take a deep dive there, and you're going to get to know that really well, okay? So what it is, cancer of the colon or the rectum. Well, how common is it? Looking at the 2023 data, there are over 106,000 cases of colon cancer, and there are over 40,000 new cases of rectal cancer. So we can see that it is common, even though we do have a really big country here in the United States. Another important question, so colorectal cancer is common, you know, tens of thousands, 100,000 cases. Well, how many deaths are there? Well, there are 40,000 or more deaths from colorectal cancer in 2023 alone. Okay, so 106,000 cases of colon cancer, 46,000 cases of rectal cancer, and over 40,000 deaths. Well, what are the trends? Overall, the trend of colorectal cancer, the incidence is decreasing, all right? Both the incidence and the mortality. However, there are some exceptions to this. And so what populations do we see an increase in incidence and an increase in mortality? Think about it. Well, we're seeing an increased incidence of colorectal cancer in people under the age of 65 years. Now that might be multifactorial, okay? It may be because we're doing improved screening, so we're gonna catch more cancers if we're screening for them, all right? But we're also seeing an increased mortality from colorectal cancer in patients younger than 50 years old. Where are we seeing rapid declines in colorectal cancer? Well, that's in patients greater than 65 years old, and that's because of earlier diagnosis and better treatment modalities, and that is decreasing at over 3% year after year. So it's hard to talk about cancer of the colon without at least a rudimentary understanding of the anatomy. So if you're a medical student or a resident, then you probably have a very detailed understanding of the anatomy. I hope that you do, but let's review it. So we have the colon right here, okay, in all of its glory, and that starts at the cecum. So the ileum, or the last part of the small intestine, drains into the cecum, okay? The appendix comes off the cecum. This part of the colon is supplied by the ileocolic artery off the superior mesenteric artery, and that goes all the way through the ascending colon, the hepatic flexure of the liver, and the transverse colon. So that's all supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. Now we get this watershed area at the splenic flexure, and that's where we have the descending colon, as well as the sigmoid colon and the proximal rectum, and those are supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. And then we get to the rectum, and the rectum has a shared blood supply, this coming both from the inferior mesenteric artery for the superior blood supply, and then off the internal iliac arteries, the systemic blood flow for the inferior part of the rectum, and that is the anatomy of the colon and the rectum. So when we get into the treatment videos, we're gonna take a more detailed look at the vascular supply, and we're gonna talk about, you know, these arteries that help in the watershed areas, like the marginal artery of Drummond. Well, let's save that for the treatment talk. Okay, 
what are we going to get into now? We understand the anatomy, but do we? Or do we have to take an even deeper look? Let's take a deep look and look at the lining of the colon. So what does that look like? So when we take a histological cross-section of the colon, we can see that there are many layers. And this is important when we talk about cancers and adenomas because those layers will help define what's an adenoma, what's carcinoma in situ, and what's a cancer. Okay, so we have the mucosa. Below that is the muscularis mucosa. Below that is the submucosa. Below that is the muscularis propria. Okay, that's going to be those circular longitudinal muscular layers. And then we're going to have the serosa or the outermost covering of the colon. And that is what the wall of the colon and the rectum look like. Now the question becomes, how do we go from this beautiful histologic cross-section to cancer? All right, well, let's look at that. And this is what's called the adenoma carcinoma sequence. So look at this. I took the beautiful drawing you just saw and I made a cartoon out of it. It's less beautiful, but I think it's going to be pretty descriptive. So we have all the same layers. We have the mucosa, we have the muscularis mucosa, we have the submucosa, the muscularis propria, and the serosa, okay? So what does it look like? So first we just have normal everyday colonic epithelium, and then one day, for whatever reason, we get an adenoma. Now this is a small adenoma. What's an adenoma? An adenoma is a collection of glandular tissue in the mucosa, okay? And there are different types of adenomas. So not only do we have small adenomas and large adenomas, we have tubular adenomas. We have tubulovillous adenomas, and we have villous adenomas. Now, of the three, villous adenomas have the greatest likelihood of becoming a cancer. If we're going to take small versus large, we could say small adenomas, on average, have about a 5% risk of becoming a cancer. And look at here, a large adenoma, so a large adenoma is greater than one centimeter in size, has about a 10% risk of becoming a cancer. So this sequence begins from normal mucosa to small adenoma. That adenoma grows, becomes a large adenoma, and then what? So if that large adenoma continues to grow and is not taken out by colonoscopy, a snare or something, then we're at risk of forming a carcinoma in situ. And that is where the cells now have become cancerous, but they've only penetrated so far as the mucosa and the muscularis mucosa. They have not penetrated into the submucosa, okay? Now, what if it keeps growing? If it keeps growing, now that carcinoma in situ has penetrated into the submucosa or even deeper into the muscularis propria, and now this is called a cancer. Now, the question you're going to ask yourself is why? Why does this happen? What is happening at the cellular level to cause this sequence from normal healthy tissue to an adenoma, a large adenoma, a carcinoma in situ, and then a cancer? Well, at the cellular level, even the genetic level, there are changes in the genes. Well, the first change is in the APC gene, or the adenomatous polyposis coli gene. Now, that's a tumor suppressor gene, and when a mutation occurs in that gene, you're unable to do cell cycle regulation. The cells become unregulated, they overgrow, and you get the formation of this adenoma. We see mutations in the APC gene in both sporadic and familial types or inherited types of colon cancer, and we're going to talk about those inherited types in just a few minutes, so hang on, all right? Well, what's the next gene that gets mutated that can cause that progression now from a small adenoma to a larger adenoma? Well, that is a proto-oncogene mutation, okay, and that is in KRAS. So KRAS, or Kristen Rat Sarcoma Viral Oncogene, that's what it stands for, okay, is a proto-oncogene. So that means when it's mutated, it results in increased cellular proliferation, right? So this is another frequent mutation that happens in the adenoma to carcinoma sequence. 
One of the final genes that gets mutated is another tumor suppressor gene, and this is the P53 gene. So the P53 gene is really in control of cell cycle regulation, and when this gets mutated, that is almost the final step that leads to the transition between an adenoma and a carcinoma. So you can see that the P53 gene is a really important gene to keep cells healthy, and when it's mutated, then you can go from an adenoma to a carcinoma. So we talked about the APC gene, the KRAS proto-oncogene, the P53 gene. There are other less common mutations. For example, BRAF, so B-R-A-F, that is another proto-oncogene that can be mutated in some colorectal cancers. So we talked about colorectal cancer, we talked about what it is, we talked about the adenoma to carcinoma sequence, and we talked about these genes. Now we need to go into the risk factors for colorectal cancer. Well, when we talk about risk factors, the best way to think about it is we have non-modifiable risk factors or risk factors we can't change and modifiable risk factors or risk factors that we can change. So what are some of the things that we can't change? Well, we can't change our age. Maybe someday we can, but we can't right now. We can't change our ethnicity or our, our background, you know, the race that we were born into. We can't change our biologically given gender, okay? If we we're given an XX chromosomes or XY chromosomes, and we can't change our family history. So those are some of the things that are non-modifiable. Well, how about modifiable? Well, here are where we can make a difference in our risk of colorectal cancer. So those would be things like diet, okay? What is our nutrition like? What is our weight? What is our level of physical activity? Are we a smoker? Do we consume alcohol? And if we have inflammatory bowel disease, is that inflammatory bowel disease managed? So those are our non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. So one big one that we talked about is family history. So 20% of all colorectal cancer is through an inherited syndrome. And there are four major inherited colorectal cancer syndromes that we wanna consider. So I have this in a quadrant right here, thought it would make it easy to visualize. And we'll start with the most common inherited colorectal cancer syndrome, and that is Lynch syndrome. So Lynch syndrome is a inherited condition that is a problem with DNA mismatch repair genes. Okay, so there's a mutation in genes that are responsible for DNA repair. And these genes are MLH1, MSH2, and MSH6, all right? Those are the three genes involved. So these patients have a much increased risk of getting colorectal cancer. They get it between 45 and 50 years old. And so when we get into the screening component of these videos, we're gonna talk about when those patients need to be screened. And the other important thing about Lynch syndrome is there's an increased risk in other cancers, especially endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, and stomach cancer. So Lynch syndrome, colorectal cancer, represents about three to 5% of all cases of colorectal cancer. And again, these patients get cancer usually between 45 and 50 years old, which is much earlier than the normal population. Now, the next one to talk about is familial adenomatous polyposis, okay? Now, this is rare, but has a very high incidence of cancer. About one in 13,000 individuals are affected, and this has to do with the APC gene, okay? Now, that should ring a bell. We talked about the APC gene as that first tumor suppressor gene that is mutated, causing that change from normal healthy mucosa to an adenoma. So very early in that adenoma to carcinoma sequence. These patients get hundreds and thousands, even thousands of polyps in their colon and their rectum and left untreated, they have a very high risk of continuing down that pathway and becoming cancer. 
These patients get cancer in their teens and 20s. And so this is a really important colon cancer syndrome that needs to be discovered very early on in life so that a patient may get a colectomy or a proctocolectomy in their early years before cancer develops. Now the next colon cancer syndrome, I'm guessing you probably haven't heard of this. This is MUTH polyposis. So M-U-T-Y-H, that's the gene involved. And this is involved in DNA excision repair. So patients with MUTH polyposis have increased polyps. They have an increased risk of these polyps becoming cancerous. And even though their risk of cancer is not as high as in Lynch syndrome or FAP, familial edematous polyposis, okay, they still have an increased risk getting cancer between 40 and 50 years old. So the last one is juvenile polyposis syndrome. This is an autosomal dominant condition where children and teenagers get uh, multiple polyps in their colon. Those polyps have an increased risk of becoming cancerous. So those are the four inherited colon cancer, colorectal cancer syndromes. So most common is Lynch, familial adenomatous polyposis. Number two, we also have MUTH polyposis and juvenile polyposis syndrome. So let's now go back into risks of getting cancer. We'll close this up. So now we talked about some of those modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, but here's a nice list, okay? So these are all of the things that increase our risk of getting colon cancer. So things like ulcerative colitis, especially untreated ulcerative colitis. Crohn's disease is another type of inflammatory bowel disease. Overconsumption of red meat, alcohol, smoking, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, low physical activity, and obesity. So th there's a common thread here, okay? So if we maintain a healthy lifestyle and a healthy weight, and we avoid getting the onset of diabetes, we avoid metabolic syndrome, avoiding obesity, we can get a ton of these modifiable risk factors off of the table, right? So these are important things to consider as we are getting older and we wanna maintain a healthy life. One thing that I discovered very recently was how important vitamin D is when it comes to colon cancer. So it's not just about the bones with vitamin D. Now, vitamin D allows us to increase our calcium uptake from the intestine. We get vitamin D through our exposure to sun or also in our diet taking supplement, okay? But if we have a vitamin D deficiency, we increase our risk of getting colorectal cancer, all right? So I recently discovered that my vitamin D levels were critically low. I'm a surgeon, I'm under fluorescent light most of the day, okay? So I make sure that I take 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3 every single day, okay? And that's gonna, hopefully, when I get my next set of labs, bump my vitamin D levels up, all right? Now, the interesting thing about vitamin D and colon cancer is it's really preventative, as in if you can maintain healthy levels, then you can take this risk factor again off the table. But once you get colon cancer, giving more vitamin D doesn't really help you. And that's been found in uh, several different papers that I can put those in the description below. Well, what are some other risk factors to think about? So I just need to reiterate, what did I just talk about? So a healthy weight, get, not avoiding obesity, avoiding heavy alcohol intake, avoiding being a smoker, not having uncontrolled diabetes, having a good amount of physical activity. And there's some data out there that metformin might decrease our risk of getting colon cancer or aspirin may decrease our risk, but this is questionable in the trials and certainly I'm not recommending that you take either of those or prescribe either of those medications. All right, so that is our introduction to colorectal cancer. We talked about what it is. We talked about the epidemiology. So how common is it? We also went through and we talked about the trends. Then we went through that adenoma carcinoma sequence talking about three important genes. And those were, can you remember? That's the APC gene, KRAS, and of course, P53. After we did that, we took a little deep dive into the inherited colorectal cancer syndromes, talking about Lynch syndrome, FAP, MUTH polyposis, juvenile polyposis syndrome, and then we got into our modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors with a little bit more detail. So I hope you enjoyed that today. If you have any questions, leave them in the description below. I love engaging with you. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, share, join the community. I'm pumped to have you here. 
As always, study hard, stay safe. I'll see you next time for part two.